I'm hoping you're going to keep me on entertained as um, hopefully I'll entertain you. Um, last time we talked about three gardens, this time we're going to talk about three gardens again. And I've chosen, we're kind of going on a tour up the west coast then across to the east. So we're going to start at NBU Gardens, where I used to work um, as the propagator for 14 years. And so I've got lots of really good juicy stories about NBU Gardens. Then I'm going to take you across to the east coast, north of Inverness, up to Dunbeath Castle, and then Langwell Gardens uh, in Beresdale. And I'm sure some of you probably know of them, maybe even have been to them. But at the end of each uh, section of slides, I would be very happy to answer questions um, about them. I have to say, all these gardens are all my favorites. I love them all, but they're all very, very different in their own way. So, um, yeah, I'll just say a little bit more about myself. Um, I live on the West Coast, just 17 miles south of NBU. And we have a garden called Two Durnham Up, which we also open to the public. And um, I'm very lucky actually, because I've got two gardens. I've got uh, Lady Jane Rice's garden down the road, Wall Garden, where my partner, husband, um, is the head gardener. And obviously, um, I, well, she's not there very often. So we call it Will's Garden and um, I'm allowed to walk around it. And so I just think I am one of the luckiest people in the world to have such two beautiful places to walk around. Anyway, you will gather through this talk that I'm very passionate about several things in life. Plants and gardens is one of them. Um, so without further ado, I was gonna ask Pauline quickly to put up my first slide for tonight, if that's possible, mm -hmm. which is in view. Uh, we um, sorted them through which doesn't mean that they're sorted at all, really. Um, so you're gonna to have to bear with me. I'm pretty sure all the right gardens are in the right section, yeah. but they could be jumbled up. So we could be looking at a picture of the pond suddenly when I'm talking about the walled garden, but I'm sure, I'm sure that won't happen. So this is in view garden. This is actually the visitor center when you arrive. This is the first thing you'll actually see. In view, for those of you that don't know it, is a West Coast garden um, set, it's about 60 acres, and it was founded by Oscar McKenzie, who was born in 1842. So he's just slightly older than me, not much. Um, and when he was 20 years old in 1862, he, well, he discovered that he actually owned 12,000 acres. His mum very kindly bought it as a birthday present for him. And he decided that he would quite like to design a garden. Good on him. And true to Victorian form, he went across Europe um, on a, the grand tour and was so inspired by what he saw. He had, luckily, he, he had a cousin, uh, Robert Hanbury, who um, owned a garden in Monton on the French Riviera. And he thought, I would like something like that. And um, I'm very glad that he did actually, because he was probably one of the first inspirational gardeners in this part um, of the world, certainly. So he set about basically, um, there was just nothing but peat and bog, nothing at all. And it's right on the edge of the sea. So he set about planting a shelter belt first and he got local crofters to come up with creels of seaweed on their back, fill up holes that they had dug and plant trees in there. The seaweed was a, a good fertilizer, but the peat needed something. And he left the trees to grow. And in the meantime, he, his mum, good mum, good old mum, she built his baronial type mansion for him and the walled garden. Now, over time, he managed to fill it up with plants sent over from uh, India, Asia, South Africa. He also went to South Africa himself. He had friends like Joseph Hooker um, to send him seed. And I think what we'll do is move on to the next slide if that's possible, Pauline. Ooh, that's not it. <laughs> right, no, don't worry, don't worry. There you go. That's okay. Yay, that's it. So what we're looking at here is the nursery area of Inview Gardens. The greenhouse at the back is his original greenhouse where he used to grow the seeds sent over from Asia, et cetera. This is my office. This was my office. I worked there from 1996 uh, until 2010, I think, when I left. Um, 
These plants you see in front of you are called dioramas, they're angels fishing rods, which I collected when I went out to South Africa. I was very lucky being propagator, I got to travel quite a bit um, to go and collect seeds and plants from different countries, which was wonderful. Anyway, um, to get back to Osgood, he basically had huge amounts of inspiration to do this because as you know, NBU is quite far north. In fact, it's closer to the Arctic Circle than it is to St. Petersburg, which is quite amazing. It's 57.8 degrees north latitude, which is very far north. But because it's by the sea, it has this amazing temperate um, climate, which means that um, it gets high rainfall, lots and lots of wind, but very little snow and very little prolonged frost, apart from this year, that is perhaps. Uh, there's always one rule, one exception to the rule, isn't there? So obviously he's still not alive. Um, his daughter, Mary Sawyer, took it on when he died and she married twice. Her first husband very sadly died and so did her children. Now this is an interesting thing. When Osgood built his walled garden, which is beautiful, we're going to see. Um, actually, if we move on to the next slide, Pauline, and one second. I really struggle to choose slides. I have 70,000 slides and I have to try and um, def run, uh, define down what I'm going to pick. But what I wanted to show you was quickly the glass house. Um, this is my one of my propagating glass houses, which I loved. I loved walking in here in the morning and the smell of the plants was wonderful. And um, I actually had growing lights in there too. So in January, I um, used to go in and turn up the heat. So I just felt quite warm, took a cup of tea in there and the growing lights, it was a bit like being on a tropical beach actually, it was amazing. So if we go into the next slide again, Pauline. Mm -hmm. um, so going on to the walled garden where Osgood built his uh, vegetable garden, he evicted an old lady from her house to build his walled garden and legend has it she was of course a witch because she was a lady living on her own and um, that's part of the course but she did pass a, cur a curse on him and said that he would never have an heir to succeed him which has actually come true um, he didn't have an heir to succeed him and so after Mary's death in 1952 um, the garden she actually arranged with the National Trust for Scotland to take it on in 1952, sorry, and she died in 1953. Very sadly, apparently she was really lovely, whereas actually her father, Osgood, wasn't such a nice man. He, um, his wife's money basically paid for the garden and he uh, went through one of the longest divorce cases in Victorian history and um, then forbade his wife ever to see his daughter when she was 12 years old. So not a very nice man, but he had an excellent taste in plants and gardens. So without further ado, we're now in present day. This area we're looking at is South Africa, which is my passion. Um, I, being propagator, I was very spoiled. I was given the area behind the propagating section to um, grow plants. And I chose South Africa as a theme because you know, you can get away with anything. All your gazanias, mesembryanthemums, gerberas, watsonias, uh, crocosmia, they are all from South Africa. So you can have the most amazing splash of color uh, fairly cheaply actually, because you can just buy packets of seed and take cuttings and um, all it needs is well-drained soil. And actually they can cope with a lot of wind as well, these South African plants. So if we go on to the next slide, Pauline. Mm -hmm. So I should have said those yellow flowers were actually gazanias we were looking at. So this is another view of South Africa. What we're looking at is uh, Galtonia, this beautiful white flower sticking up in the front here. And in the background, you can see the pink bells of the angel's fishing rods, the dioramas. And then the blue flowers are Agapanthus. And then we have the, obviously the Crocosmia and we have Bobina latifolia, the yellow spike. And that's actually scented Pelagonium, the little crinkly variegated leaves. 
and we've got spikes of Watsonias coming up through as well. South African plants grown all together was quite a novelty when we first did this. And we had everybody from newspapers and TV people coming and filming in South Africa. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, but you know, obviously working in the West Highlands, we have terrible midges. So very often I was seen in a midge net in here. <laughs> and uh, visitors used to come past and say, oh, why have you got the midge net on? And I used to really have a hard time picking my answer. Yeah. So I used to say, first of all, this is South Africa. I'm obviously in disguise from the lions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the other thing was, the other thing I used to say was because I had a horrible disease. And then the third thing I used to say was, I'm so ugly, the National Trust won't let me out without <laughs> it on. And by that time, they were normally slapping their faces and scratching and realised actually probably it was just for the midges. Uh, anyway, we used to have endless hours of fun. Mm -hmm. So we have the next slide, Pauline. Thank you. Uh, this one. So, so the South African bed was great fun. We actually mixed the soil with a concrete mixer and put it in, that was all, all of the gardeners together. We had a ball doing it. Um, gardening is good fun when you've got a good team of people. These, I had to put this in because actually I uh, had a diorama breeding program. I brought seed back and plants back from Kirsten Bosch and some various other botanical gardens around South Africa. And I grew them here at Inview because they do so well. And uh, these were some of the best ones I picked out. I selected out some of them. And I just felt I had to show you. And if you look at the rhododendron hedge behind very closely, you can see little bits of red. That's tripolium, which actually comes from Chile. And it's called the Flame of Scotland. But obviously, it's not actually Scottish because it comes from Chile. But I love plant names like that. Um, Pauline, we have the next, next photograph. Mm -hmm. I've got more than I had last time, so I'm a little conscious of my time um, I've got allocated to you. So another South African plant, um, another South African garden area. Again, you can see aloes. So what we used to do is take them out of the greenhouses every winter in wheelbarrows and dig huge holes and plonk them in. And um, they look like they've been there forever. So it's a bit cheating gardening, but it was very beautiful. It did seem to work and add to the effect. Um, we can go on to the next slide as well, actually, Pauline. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there we go. There we go, look at that. That's the walled garden. This is the walled garden that Oscar created in tiers and levels um, when he built the house. The far end of the walled garden, um, that wall is huge. It's, I can't remember how tall it is now. That's really bad of me. I think it's about 30 foot high. Yeah, it's, it's, at least, it's at least two and a half people high. Yes, thank you, Pauline. Yeah, I'm not very good at my measurements. Anyway, it's very tall. Now he built that with using local labor with block and tackle and no machinery at all, which is absolutely incredible. It's self-facing to get maximum light. And when Osgood had it, it was obviously absolutely stuffed full of very healthy, good for you vegetables and apple trees. Um, some of the apple trees still remain against the wall, growing against the wall. He allegedly had peaches in there too and nectarines, um, not in my time, unfortunately. And even if they were, there wouldn't be any left probably because the gardeners definitely would have eaten them. <laughs> but as the trust has taken it on, it's become far more ornamental. And in fact, in Mary Sawyer's day, she loved the colour blue. So she stuffed it full of blue hydrangeas, which there still are a lot of hydrangeas in there. And you can see that's Loch Hugh we're looking at, which is um, a very deep sea loch and was fundamentally very important in Second World War. There used to be battleships anchored right across it. And the story goes, you could walk from one side of the lock to the other across the top of the battleships. Um, needless to say, Mary Sawyer made the use of the men, <laughs> good on her. And she had them in her garden, building more bits of garden. And I certainly would do that myself if I had ships full of men on my doorstep too. So, um, 
I love that. We go on to the next picture. Yeah. Pauline, sorry. All right. Vegetables. Mm. Yes, now this, I love this. I just had to put this in because it's um, cram packed. As you can see, this kale at the front is called Nero di Toscana. A really lovely dark kale. Oh, you can't get enough of that. It, mm. it looks really tough, but it's really an amazing flavor and it cooks beautifully. And guinea pigs like it too. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually that's a, a cabbage. I'm not sure which one it is behind it. And then of course we've got the lime green, the Koshiana behind that. And I think this is something that we used to do very well at NVU. We used to grow lots of flowers in between the vegetables and there wasn't really a herbal medicinal or um, bug repelling reason it was just because green vegetables can look um, very green and sometimes it's quite nice to have flowers in between just mm -hmm. to brighten it up and um, do you want to put the next one on Pauline? Yep. Mm -hmm. And I had to put an overview of the walled garden looking from this end to that end. That we shed at the end there, well, you can see there's two archways going into the, the propagation department, which was my area. And we had very definite areas of demarcation. So I met Will at InView Garden. Will's my partner. He was the walled gardener. And actually he was the propagator for one year before, but I took his job. Mm. And um, so it was a, uh, work romance if you like um we met each other but we had strict rules um he wasn't allowed through the arches into the propagation department because invariably he used to nick plants that were half grown uh, to put into the walled garden um but i'll tell you a wee secret if we go back to look at the shed at the end of the garden on the wall there that's will's tool shed and he guarded it ferociously and if anyone borrowed a tool from there he was very upset quite often. But the other secret was, is you know gardeners and their compost and how there's kind of secret special remedies and mixtures go in, bits of seaweed, bits of horse poo, anything. Well, Will had a bucket in his shed and I think you can guess what I'm gonna tell you. He actually peed in it and he kept his pee because pee is really, really good for nitrogen in the compost heap. Mm -hmm. Well, one very, very busy summer's day, I remember walking through the garden looking for Will um, to ask him something. And there were these people around the shed listening and thinking, is that a tap running in there? No, it was Will being in his bucket. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, lessons were learned. Mm -hmm. And he said it was actually his deterrent for people to go in and steal his tools. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure that was totally true. <laughs> anyway, if you can see the swags, the ropes, they were actually covered in beautiful roses. Uh, there's apple trees, there's again mixed planting. There was a bit of everything in that walled garden. And on a Friday afternoon, all the gardeners used to come down with empty sacks and fill up their sacks with vegetables to take home to eat, which was kind of part of the job, really. Um, and let's face it, actually, the, the, it supplemented their, their wages. So it was, it was a good thing. It was always good, good, healthy thing. If we have a look at the next photograph, Pauline. Mm -hmm. So this one from a different view in the wall garden. Can you see that one? No, not yet. Oh. Sometimes they take a while to come through, I think, don't they? So basically the National Trust have had it ever since. And um, they, they're, they're still a good group of gardeners there. Obviously this year, I think, I'm hoping they're still going to open actually um, when things get easier, maybe in April we're looking to see because I think gardens are one of the things that will be one of the first things to reopen again. We're very much hoping that. And what a lovely thing to go and visit as well. Yeah. Oh, you still can't see the picture, Pauline. Yeah. No. You can see me. Yeah. Not the picture. Uh, 
No, still, still see me. Yeah. Is it the sharing of the sharing of the frame? Um, yeah, I've done, I've done that. I've done that. Let me just let me just readjust. Yeah, that's fine. Hey, anyway, so um, today Osgood's shelter belt is absolutely huge, as you can imagine. It is very very big. And now we have the opposite pro problem there is that the trees are so big and old and they are so, so beautiful um, that they won't allow any other trees, younger trees to be planted underneath. That's the thing with mature woodland, uh, especially pine, which a lot of the shelter belt is. Um, they don't, it, trees don't eat, readily germinate underneath. They have a pheromone that they release and um, they won't allow seedlings to compete with them so the trust have got this issue that they have to wait for a storm to happen for trees to be able to fall down before they can plant back the shelter belt. And the shelter belt is absolutely needed. In uh, 1952, actually the year that Mary Sawyer handed the gardens over, there were recorded 140 mile an hour winds, which took out a large part of the shelter belt, which was really, really, um, Tragic. Still can't see the picture, Pauline, oh, just to give you the heads up. No. You can see it on my mirror. Right. Um, and we've had one such storm since then, um, which I'm just trying to remember the date that was. That must have been in 2000, 2002 perhaps. And again, devastation. Lots of firewood came out, broken greenhouses. Um, but I always say that once you have a bad storm, it gives you an opportunity to plant new plants. Um, it's a bit like this winter. We've just had a shockingly cold time. Still not seeing the picture, Pauline. Yeah, I'm just doing it a slightly different way so I can... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Fine. Um, yeah. yeah, we had a shockingly cold winter and I don't know about any of you, um, mm. but we've lost a few plants in our garden this winter and I was quite sad. But then I thought, well, actually, you know, it just gives me a good excuse to buy some more plants um, to plant in. And I'm never shy of buying more and more plants. So, no, still not you see picture. It no. It's not blooming working. Uh, yeah. Right. Don't know. Um, I can't really suggest anything from this end. So what I was going to show you basically was, um, you see that? No, no, no. the, uh, as I say, the garden 60 acres to choose the garden, to choose pictures of the whole garden, um, is quite difficult to do that. So I kind of picked the most flowery and probably some of the most interesting aspects of the garden. Um, and I suddenly realized I hadn't actually put one of the modern house, well, not so modern actually, because when um, the house, the large, yeah, we can see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have a picture. So this is that they were standing at the bottom of the walled garden, looking down through the dense, lush growth, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, and you can see in the background, obviously, the shelter belt there. I don't know, dare I ask you, Pauline, if we can go on to the next slide? I spent all that time and then you just, you just glance over that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to keep everybody for hours. I've got quite a few to get through. I was just a bit yeah, concerned. That's fine. Don't worry, that was fine. So this is now <laughs> what we're looking at here. This is actually up from the wall garden, and this is part of the main part of the garden, again, that Osgood designed. This is called Rhododendron Walk. And the plants we can see along the edges of the path are called erythroniums. And I love the edgings of these plant, uh, this path because um, we have another plant called Darmira pal palmata, which comes up uh, big umbels of flowers. They're followed by huge, big disc-like leaves, which turn blood red in the autumn. But before, this is really early. This is uh, probably about um, now, actually, this time of year, March. So we've got these beautiful erythroniums that come up through first. And then either side of the path is just a mass of color of azaleas, rhododendrons, and magnolias. 
Now I'm going to tell you very quickly two things. This path was built on a bog and they used birch twigs. So he cut down birch trees, used the twigs and compressed loads of gravel on top. So when you take a tractor down this path, it undulates. It actually, you can feel it wobbling up and down. <laughs> and I was amazed when I was told by Clive, the head gardener, about this. And he said, oh, most of Scotland's railways are built in this way across peat bogs. And I was thinking, oh, really? <laughs> the second thing is you see the end of the track, the end of the path where those pines are. If you continue past down that path, it goes down to a wee bay in the sea. That's called Pender's Walk. It was named um, after an American author that came to stay with Mary Sawyer. And she said, you know, some visitors just can stay for too long. This man's been with me for six months. And she said, I wouldn't mind if I didn't have to keep seeing him stark naked every day. Mm -hmm. Apparently he used to strip right off and uh, naked, run down through the garden every morning and swim in the sea, no matter sun <laughs> or shine. And I used to take groups of Americans down there and say, have we got any volunteers <laughs> to um, reconstruct history? And you can always see everybody shuffling around and moving away from me rapidly. And that's good. <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd just quickly put in that wee story there because I thought it was rather nice. Yeah. So uh, Pauline, can we have another picture, please? Okay. Mm. And these are some of the absolutely beautiful, beautiful azaleas. These are scented azaleas, uh, Japanese azaleas. And these are actually along azalea walk. Um, and yes, the smell is really intoxicating. I, uh, May is a good time of year. May is the best time of year to go to see in view gardens. But you do need stout walking shoes. Luckily, there's two cafes. There's a restaurant in the car park and a cafe now at the house as well um, to get lots of um, cake and tea to keep you going around the garden. Um, but absolutely, really, really beautiful. And if we could go on to the next one, Pauline. Mm -hmm. May is always also when the Mechanopsis comes out. Is that right, Sue? Yes, it is. Yeah, Mechanopsis as well. And so actually that was my, uh, this is my parting farewell picture. I just wanted to put this in. Um, if you're driving south from Inview Gardens down to uh, Grinyard Garden or our garden North. or Dundonald Garden, this is a viewpoint overlooking Grinyard Bay, yeah. which is absolutely stunning. And for those of you that don't live or near the west coast of Scotland, um, this is why you have to come and see us basically. Yeah. Um, so this is a good point actually to stop. There's many, many, many more photographs I feel I could and should have put in within the gardens, but as I say, I found it difficult to choose. Um, should we stop and have a question? Yes. Question yes. time, is that okay, Pauline? Yes, of course, yes. So I can ask everyone to unmute if you want to ask a question and there. Uh, just a quick, quick show of hands. Who's been at Inverview Gardens? Oh, quite a few. Quite a few, that's good. That's good, yes. That's good. Did yes, you hear, hear the, the pedal in the bucket? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone worked it in view? I wonder if any of you have wor ever worked there? No. 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 no, I haven't worked there. I'm actually on your screen as Andrew, but I, my name is Heather and I was MacDonald. And I I come from the area and I eventually ended up in Edinburgh, then escaped to West Lothian and I have made a garden in West Lothian. So oh. I am akin to your spirit, dear oh, friend. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So you must have gone, Heather, did you go to NBU when you lived here? Yes, uh, the first time I was there was in 1962. <laughs> And wow. I've had a few visits over the years since then. Great. So in 1962, it would have looked very different, I would imagine. Very, very, very different, yes. yes. It, was, it was in the development stage of the modern garden, as you know it. Yes, indeed, yeah. indeed. I love that over the years, how it changes. And it's people amazing. to tell me yeah. about it, the history it of it. It was lovely to see it. I mean, there was no cafe or anything then. It was pure interest in plants. 
just mm. garden yes yeah. I like that I like that I um I used to see it before I worked there I used to come up to Scotland from Sussex oh my my word I think it must be in the 1980s and the restaurant there was a small restaurant there then but again it's changed since it's changed yeah. quite a lot mm -hmm. it's become more commercial which is a pity yeah. in some ways yeah. but it's still it doesn't take away from the beauty of the garden the, the structure no, and the bones yeah. and the fact it's on that peninsula with sea either side it is it's a really special place yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. i did a stupid thing yeah. i i decided to go into the hill 700 feet up in the teeth of the westerlies to make a garden. Oh, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> well done, you. And, and was it I love that. Was it success, Heather? I like and a challenge. Like to your garden. We'd Sorry? like to see your garden. <laughs> well, I, I, I have opened it in the past, but I'm a little bit passy now. It's a bit much for me. So oh. I, I enjoy the garden and my dogs. Mm -hmm. but I don't open to the public. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad you still enjoy it. That's oh, good. Yes. You, oh. are, you the, are you the Heather with the Bernese Mountain Dogs? Absolutely. You are. Yes. That's lovely. That's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're my loves and my life, other than the garden. Great. Beautiful. <laughs> well, we look forward to you, Heather. You should show some, tell your story in the magazine. That would be nice. Okay, I'll yeah. have a go at that. Yeah, yeah. that would be good. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Thank Heather. You, Thank you. Um, let's see who else is who else has got a question. Anyone got a question about Inverview or anything else just now, or should we carry on and, and go on? To, oh no, hang on, hang on. Hang on. I can see me. Me, you've got a question, yeah? Well, not a question. I've got a photograph here. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, yes. Of my niece. Oh, in yes. one of the trees in Veru Gardens. Oh, very it nice. It sits in my, in my oh, mantelpiece. Oh, oh, I, I look at that. that every... I know that tree. It's the eucalyptus tree that's on the rock garden. Yeah. And it's huge, yeah. absolutely huge. And it was planted in Mary Sawyer's time. So it's probably nearing 100 years old now, more than that. And it blew over one storm. It blew right down on top of the rock garden um, and grew back up again. And it's supported by the rock garden, basically. Mm -hmm. So your niece would have climbed on it when it had blown down. Mm -hmm. And it's the best yeah. climbing tree ever. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> I love yeah. that. And, and the day that we were there, there was a little robin along the, the pathway and it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. If I had thought, I would have dug out my photographs of that, but mm -hmm. didn't oh. think. Uh, we, we used to have robins sit on our spades when we were working, and they were very, mm -hmm. very friendly. And they got so cheeky. Um, if you had white toggles on your jacket, they used to fly up and peck at your white toggles <laughs> when you were working. And you had to be really careful not to smile so they didn't go for their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> But they didn't have cat. Well, they did have cats actually at Inview for a while, um, but most of them were too fat and lazy to do anything about the birds. Yeah. So the birds were very, very friendly. There were amazing, amazing amount of birds there. Yeah, that was lovely. Great. Great. That was nice, me. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I think Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Bandin. I think you've got your hand up. I might come to you next. Hang on a sec. How are you? Hang on a sec. We'll need to find you. Wave at me, Elizabeth, so I can find you on the. <laughs> Where is she? Where's Elizabeth? I'm really sorry. I'm dancing. You're dancing. dancing. You're dancing. <laughs> oh, yes, I can see you now. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> sorry. I've got four screens to go through. That's it takes me. <laughs> on this isn't it wonderful hello um i wanted to ask please there was a picture that you put up of those lovely flowers what, what were they called angels fishing rods yes um, was was there some was there white blade was there like a grass that you had mixed in with that no that was the leaf actually yeah. elizabeth um okay. so the diorama is a bulb it's a small bulb and it has really sword-like thin 
really tough leaves that um, grow out of it as well. And then the fine, fine stem comes up with the flowers and it arches over. Um, they normally flower late summer from July, August, August time. And um, I'm just trying to think, one. you can get them, most nurseries will sell them, but what you need to, where you need to grow them, basically they don't like uh, fertile soil. They like really well drained, really poor soil, which is where you, you find them in the Drakensberg mountains in South Africa. And it's really, really impoverished, like rocky, gritty, sandy, horrible stuff. Um, where you get porcupines running around and munching the bulbs and pooping them out and the seed, and then they just grow nice. again. So we're kind of emulating that. So when we built uh, this South African garden, we just basically put rubble and sand in the bed and planted straight into that. And if you go to Inview and you look at the soil, there's no soil. It's kind of, it is, it's just literally the poorest thing you can find. So if you have a raised beach, it's perfect for just gravel and shingle. And they do quite like um, full sun as well warmth if well, possible. I'm, I'm very lucky that my back garden faces full west and gets the sun right down from nine o'clock or so at night before it dips down behind other houses. Um, but the front of my property, um, I just stayed in a four and a block in Glasgow, um, it faces east, um, but the soil round about here is apps, it's really, it's cloggy and clay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Really crap and when, it's, when it rains it stays sodden quite right long for a long time yeah um i would say i i, I would say actually unfortunately dioramas are one of the plants that really don't enjoy growing in pots even really deep pots for some reason they just don't um don't get on in that situation the only thing i could suggest is if you build a kind of a raised bed of some sort like a frame oh, and fill it with Grit but and gravel. A four and a block. I'm the ground floor. Yeah. I'm a, a ground floor flat with my own back and front garden. So mm -hmm. how how blessed am Wonderful. I? Yeah. It sounds perfect. Sounds perfect. Yes. yes. So yes. anything, an old fish box may be filled with gravel, but it likes quite a good depth. They have a long tap root from the bulb. It has a long tap root. Mm -hmm. um, and once you've got your plant planted, they don't like being moved. So choose carefully where you want it and stick it in and see how you go with it. But it sounds ideal, um, you know, being in a flat and in the middle of Glasgow, it'd be quite warm, I would imagine. So yeah. um, it may well quite like that. Yeah, we're very lucky that, well, down near me, I've got a, a really great nursery called McLaren's that is like mm. 60 acres of, it's like, honestly, during lockdown I'm a massage therapist unable to work at the moment oh. and I've just developed such a crush on Monty Dawn. <laughs> oh yeah, oh me too, haven't we all? Oh my goodness. You're like, what you do tonight? And I'm like, Friday night, Gardener's World, gin and tonic, yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Isn't he just wonderful? You know what, you could just go to sleep listening to his voice. <laughs> I've gone to Monty's, Monty's been to your house, hasn't he? <gasps> No, sadly, oh, not I have to say, actually, we're, we're waiting for him to turn up. Um, mm -hmm. Monty was going to come to our house, but he actually expressed a wish to go to Dundonald, uh, which I would have been happy with because I would have made sure I was serving him tea or something. <laughs> but we did have Francis here. Um, the, yes. Well, yeah, the Gardener's World said um, they wanted a film. And I said, yeah, if you send Monty, I'm absolutely happy about that. And they said, well, we'll see what he, we can do, but he does want to go to see Dundonald. And I said, well, I'm very happy for him to go there too. Unfortunately, he did not manage to make it to Dundonald because he went to Italy or somewhere. <laughs> but we had Frances, who was really lovely, and she came and filmed here. And do you know what? Her partner was a cameraman for the Paul Dark series. So it just gets better and better, doesn't it? <laughs> and I, I wasn't that enamored about... I, well, I don't mind the garden being filmed and the plants, that's great, but I hated me being filmed. Mm. I absolutely hated the whole thing. And I said to Francis afterwards, do you know what? I'm just not gonna go for that part opposite Ross Poldark, even if I do get to kiss him. I just don't like the filming thing. 
Yeah. But yes, so yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're holding out for Monty still. We want Monty yeah. to come. <laughs> mm -hmm. can, can I can I speak it? Thank, Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Carol, yeah. Hi, Carol. Hang on. Hi. Um, well, you're speaking that would be in film. I'm from Five E in Aberdeenshire. We've got a Five E yeah. castle and we've got lovely gardens there. Yeah. But once when we were up at um, Inverview Gardens, now my son was, uh, he might have been about three or four because we were collecting beautiful coloured leaves from, um, uh, from Inverview and there was beautiful colours. And it was my husband, myself, my daughter and my son. And we're from Northeast Aberdeenshire speaking the Doric, just as we were doing, just our own little language. And this man said to me, excuse me, what language are you speaking? <laughs> and, and, I, and I said, oh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a Northeast dialect. It's a Doric. Um, a, we're speaking Scottish, but our own dialect. And he was from Belgium. Oh. And he asked me, he filmed me and asked me to say something into this camera. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if this was going to be promoting in for you gardens, <laughs> but, but if anybody saw uh, me on the TV in Belgium 30 years ago, I was, I was speaking, I was describing the, the, the gardens as beautiful as I could, trying to put on my Doric accent, but speaking sort of pan loaf as well. So that's my story. I love <laughs> that. How wonderful, Carol. <laughs> That's about 30 it. years ago. <laughs> I would love to have heard that, actually. That would have been amazing. Yeah. It would be really good promotion. It would have been fantastic for yes. Yes. NBA. Yeah. We've, been, we've been back a few times. We're, we're liking for you gardens. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> Carol, if I can just jump in and say, for like quine, who's your deuce? I'm not bad. I'm not bad. If I can, yeah. If I can, I'm, yeah. I'm favour Dean and I, and I love nothing here. The okay. people in mother tongue being spoken, and I love confusing <laughs> us. You, you can't, you can't beat it. We haven't, we haven't got subtitles. I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and when I come back up the road to, to eh? see my family and my boyfriend in Glasgow. He just looks at me like this because he just can't think I'm speaking oh. about. Right. We, we've, we've actually been, Finn, we've been in holiday. And my husband and I are speaking to each other. We speak sort of fast, quick. We've been taken for German. You can so we can we can we can quite easily be speaking away. Nobody knows what we're saying. <laughs> but I'm putting on my pan loaf just now. <laughs> yeah. so, thanks very thanks very much, ladies. Thank you. Um, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> can we go on? We go on to the next one. Is that is that Dundee? Yeah, don't beat. Yes, let's go on yeah, to don't beat. Yeah. Questions. We will come back at the end for questions. Too. Yeah, no, definitely. We're going to don't beat. Um, don't beat. Oh. oh, you're frozen. Oh, you've not. You've not. Were you just mm. sing very, very fast? Oh, no. I not again. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Dunby, the number one, number one. Yeah. Uh, Has anyone been to Dunby's Castle? Yes. I'm hoping so. Yes. Because um, I'm passionate about this place too. Um, this is the most, one of the most amazing, it's the most incredible setting. And I mean, it's like a fairy tale castle, isn't it? I mean, just look at that. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, this is Dunbeath Castle on the northeast coast, uh, north of Inverness, quite far north of Inverness, actually. North of uh, Dunrobin Castle as well. Yes. This castle was actually built in about the 15th century and was added on until the 17th century and a bit more in the 19th century. <laughs> it belonged to the Sinclair clan for about 325 years. Um, they lost it for a while and then they got it back again. It's had, uh, it's been through various owners actually since the Sinclair clan. And what was interesting is um, the Duke of Montrose, I think it was his wife, I actually may have got my history wrong here. I believe it was him 
he ended up being beheaded or hung anyway in, in Edinburgh, but he left his wife behind and expected her to defend the castle. Needless to say, she didn't actually decide to do that. And she just let the um, opposition to come and take the castle over. Anyway, eventually the Sinclairs actually got it back again. Um, so since then, uh, to be quite honest with you, in 1997, it was actually sold to the present owner, Stuart Wyndham Murray, Murray Tripland. Um, and he actually bought it off Stanton Avery of Sticky Label Notoriety. Mm -hmm. Apparently this, he was an American, Stanton Avery, and he designed or made, or I guess maybe he invented Sticky Labels mm -hmm. and became a multimillionaire. Anyway, he only owned Dunbeath Castle for a year and decided it wasn't for him. I suspect he probably thought it was a wee bit chilly actually. Yeah. So in 1997, when it was bought by, I have to look at the piece of paper to get his, the gentleman's name cor um, correct, Stuart Wyndham Murray Tripled, Tripland, sorry. Tripland. He did it, thank you. Do you know him, Pauline? Yes. Have you, heard, have you met him? Mm -hmm. Who's that? You've met him, yeah. Yes. Someone's right. I, I haven't actually met him. I've met, I know the gardeners. Obviously, gardeners always know gardeners. Um, I suspect he's a very nice man because he's got impeccable taste in plants. Anyway, in 1997, he did major repairs to the walls and to the house itself. If we could have a look at the next picture, Pauline, yeah. that's okay. So what, what I'm going to say actually as well about Sir, um, Mr. Tripland, I think is going to be the way I'm going to say his name. Um, he was actually a descendant of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Um, well, no, actually not Bonnie Prince Charlie, Bonnie Prince Charlie's personal physician. <laughs> and because he was a descendant of the personal physician, he ended up, or their family, the Triplands, in, uh, inherited a heap of Jacobite memorabilia. Mark Tripland, um, the brother, actually sold off to the tune of 1.4 million a lot of this Jacobite bling, Bonnie Prince Charlie stuff, including a silver dog collar. Can you believe that? Mm. Anyway, I suspect that probably a lot of them have ended up in museums, and for, so maybe it was for... Um, you know, it was probably quite a good thing. So what we're looking at here, these two handsome men here, these are the most fabulous, talented gardeners. So we have um, Neil on the left, who's the head gardener, and Stephen on the right, who is incredibly, they're both very, very talented in their own way, and such lovely, lovely men. Um, Stephen has a huge passion for dahlias. I just had to put that in there. Um, and they posed beautifully for me. So, should we go on to the next slide, Pauline, with no further, further ado? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. so, actually, um, I will actually say this now. For those of you that have never been to Dunbeath, it's Dunbeath Castle. You have to go through Dunbeath itself, and then you turn in to this incredibly narrow gateway and then drive half a mile up a tree-lined drive towards the castle. And it is singularly most impressive driveway I have ever seen. And um, if I was going to take a castle, I don't think I would take Dunbeath because it's just quite intimidating. The castle is beautiful, but the driveway itself is quite intimidating. And the, but the best part about this castle is the fact it's got two walled gardens. Can you imagine mm -hmm. having one walled garden is really special. Having two walled gardens is even more special. Pauline, we can't see the picture. Yeah. I'm sorry, my dear. That should be it. Oh, we can now. <laughs> there we have it. So um, we're going into uh, the first of the walled garden. This was actually the original castle's um, vegetable garden. And this was developed by Mr. Thri Tripland himself, this area. As I say, he renovated the walls, he renovated the laundry house into which he put, um, I'm gonna have to, I remember what he put in here. He put a swimming pool, I think, in, in the, can you believe that, fitting a law in a laundry house? He, um, a swimming pool, 
I, I think a plunge bath and a toilet. Can you believe that? And I think there was a substantial drinks cabinet in there too. <laughs> so everything in this garden is Mr. Thriplin's taste. This beautiful marble carved um, marble pillar is really, I, it, it, to me, it kind of sums up the garden. There's a lot of hard surfaces. There's a lot of grass. Um, it's edged by thick hedges, but there's lots of kind of hard, kind of sticking up pillars and hard um, landscaping in a very green sort of area with not that much soft planting. I think Neil's tried to soften it a little bit with the hostas and things, but it's really, it's quite beautiful. It actually enhances, um, it kind of leads your eye basically out to the sea. We have the next slide, Pauline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this again, this is another hard sticking up structure. It's um, again, hard landscaping and it's kind of bits of stone. It's difficult to describe really because the garden is so much grass um, with uh, little summer houses. He's rather than building beds and using plants to give um, any height, he's used structural stones really to do so. And it does work quite well, but it's extremely masculine which is quite interesting. This fountain, it just, it was so brilliant actually. I thought it looked a little bit like Neil. I didn't tell him that at the time. <laughs> anyway, it is, it's quite lovely. We have the next slide, Pauline, if that's okay. So this is a summer house that he built. Um, and it has the most substantial bar inside it too. So you can go and sip your gin and tonic and it has to be substantial because uh, they get 100 mile an hour gales here um, quite frequently. Just the other side of that wall is the sea, literally that's the castle and it drops sheer down a good 100 feet or so down onto the beach, um, but they get the wildest storms. So they get a lot of salt spray hitting the bottom of the castle wall and the wall to the walled garden and coming up over into the garden. So here we have, it's a good ex example of what I was saying about the wide sweeping kind of mint green grasses with a little bit of soft planting, which I think is Neil probably more so. Um, and just stark really, but very beautiful too. I, I, really, I really like it. And it's interesting actually, because when I take groups of people there, the way they, they seem to huddle close together, although there's a lot of space because they feel exposed, I suppose, in the garden. I, can, I really get that. Um, but it is a really interesting garden. We have the next slide, Pauline, thank you. Mm -hmm. There we go. And these again, really beautiful bowls, um, very, very expensive bowls, needless to say, and water features again, upward thrusting water features in sort of a flat landscape. I found that quite interesting, water and stone being used as the, um, the vertical kind of uh, structures in the garden. And little, these are, I think these are primulas we can see in flower around. This must have been springtime when I was there. Um, but really very stately, uh, very elegant, and somehow it does seem to complement the castle very well. Mm -hmm. If we have the next one, um, if that's okay, Pauline. Yes. I'm just um, trying to find a piece of, that's it. So that laundry room was actually now, it's called a picnic. He calls it his picnic room. And it's got a bathroom and a plunge pool. That's what was in it. So did we miss the lawnmower? Oh, we did miss the lawnmower, sorry, hang on. Oh, sorry, the lawnmower is important because the oh, lawnmower, okay. if we can, can you, are you able to find it? I can, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, mean, I, thought, I thought we'd put it in the wrong place. I thought, oh, that's, that's, not, that's not meant to be there, but it's... Uh, Possibly we've missed the lawnmower. Yeah, there it is. There we go. There's the lawnmower. Now, 
that little tiny thing that looks like a vacuum cleaner is serious, serious piece of machinery. It's an intelligent lawnmower. Can you get that? Yeah. It cost £4,000, so not for the faint-hearted, but it's got cameras and sensors all around it. So it knows exactly when it's going to fall into a pond and hopefully doesn't mm -hmm. and gets to the edge and it can cut right up against the edge, the herbaceous border, really neatly without falling in. And it turns around and it just moves around the edges of the garden randomly and it chews up the grass really, really finely and actually spits it back out again. So it feeds the lawn. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was very impressed because it is a, a big area of grass and obviously Neil and Stephen love it because it means they don't have to get their lawnmower out. The only reservation I had about it was after walking across the grass, looking at all the beautiful plants and flower beds and views. Um, our shoes were absolutely clouted in tiny bits of grass mm -hmm. on a wet day, uh, which isn't ideal if you go and walk into the house, obviously. But still, I just thought I had to share that lawnmower with you. Mm -hmm. So we have the next photo, Pauline. Yes. Uh, which probably was the one we had on just now, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually just halfway up the drive to give you an idea of the vista going up and these beautiful, I mean, not only was the drive sunken between these two banks, they planted these monstrous trees either side. So it gives you a feeling that you're just an ant walking up the drive and it's pure splendid grandeur either side of you. Um, really very impressive. And you can see there's a wall on both left and right. That is exactly it. It's like a yin and yang garden a his and hers garden. So we've just seen the very male side, Mr. Thriplin's personal choice of garden. And if we go to the next slide, Pauline. Mm -hmm. I just know when you see, I mean, for those of you that have been to Dunbeath, you know exactly what, um, well, what there is there. How do I say this? Um, when I first went there, I, I had heard it was a yin and yang garden and it was a his and hers. I had no idea the contrast. We haven't got the picture, Pauline, sorry. Um, I had no idea how big a contrast between the two gardens it actually would be. And I love this. Don't you just love this? Look at this. This is an old bath. But <laughs> what are those legs on the bottom of the bath? They look like sheep's legs or yeah. dog's legs or something. It's the most extraordinary bathtub I have ever seen and painted black. It's positively hilarious. I think it's rather wonderful. Mm -hmm. I suspect they probably planted up actually with tulips or something. I think if it was mine, I'd planted up with white fluffy plants or something. Anyway, I thought I had to put the bathtub <laughs> in. So if we go to the next slide, Pauline, I'm sorry, I know you've just got that one for me. All right, no, it's fine. Mm. So there we go. This yeah. is the female feminine aspect of Dumbeath. These, this walled garden was actually um, designed by uh, Mr. Thriplin's wife and a very famous Chelsea garden designer whose name is Zar Tolema. I think that's how you say it. It's spelled with an X and an A. It's a really very Chelsea sort of name actually. So she was a, a Chelsea Garden Gold Award winner and she built this garden and designed it on a cruciform. Um, so that's basically four sections with the grass path dissecting it, going up the way and across the way. And she wanted to add more warmth by adding height and privacy basically. And so she did this by adding these rooms and they are everything that the male garden isn't. They're voluptuous, they're soft, they're stuffed full of plants of different heights, and beauty, perfume, and just basically overflowing, really lovely, lacy, frilly, incredible plants. I have to say, I spent most of my time in this garden. And when I go to Dunbeath now, I always go into the male garden first and save this bit for last because it's kind of my favorite. So what we're looking at is sweet peas up the pagoda. 
and we've got delphiniums in the background and the silver foliage is um, silver ornamental pear, um, pyrus salicifolia, uh, which again is a beautiful um, backdrop to any plants. And yes, guess what? We've got some of Stephen's dahlias in the front by the looks of it. That's what the bamboo canes are for. Yes, he has a passion for dahlias. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I have to say dahlias weren't my favorite thing until the past two years. And I think it must be age related because I suddenly have a bit of a thing about dahlias, <laughs> a bit like Monty really, all a bit of a worry. Okay. So we have the next um, picture, Pauline, if that's okay. And lupins, look at those lupins, what magnificent color and height. Mm. So again, the height is achieved with these just beautiful exuberant colors and softness of, in fact, foxgloves and lupins. What a lovely, lovely combination. Really, really beautiful. If we go to the next one, Pauline. Mm -hmm. So the gardens, in fact, really haven't actually, um, they, they were, they were veg there was a vegetable garden, which was the male garden. This garden, I'm not entirely sure whether it was vegetables in here too, but I suspect it was probably a fruit garden. Castles were very practical. They actually had to feed the people that lived there. So they had a lot of fruit and veg in, and possibly the odd cow as well, and sheep and chickens. Um, so it is probably only more recently that they've been turned into these magnificent um, floral displays. I love this slate pot with these plants in it. I think it's absolutely beautiful. And in fact, I had um, some cards made up of our garden. Um, you know, what are those called? Those visiting cards with my name and address and yeah. um, doing garden tours, etc. And I nixed this particular picture for one of my cards and um, some nice American lady had that one. She loved it too. Mm -hmm. So we have a next picture, Pauline. Yes. So this is part of the crucible. This is the center, a beautiful, beautiful sundial. And um, every single piece of this garden, it's sort of like there's hardly any grass at all. It's all flower beds and pots and bulbs and it's a plantsman's garden too. It's the most magnificent plantsman's garden. I'm just trying to think, I think it's got, um, basically that's it. It's got over 1,600 uh, plant species in this garden, which is remarkable. And bear in mind, they have 100 mile an hour winds mm. here. So this particular walled garden is obviously very, very sheltered. You can see that beautiful cardoon in the background there, that big silvery leaf thing sticking up there. It's just lovely. Mm. Should we have the next slide, Pauline? Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. Mm. And the rose arch. And look at that copper bowl below it. Isn't that to die for? I've always wanted one of those that big. I, I couldn't probably decide whether to turn it into a jacuzzi or to plant it up. Mm. I'd probably have to have half and half or a floating thing with plants in it and have it as the jacuzzi. I don't know, but it's absolutely wonderful. And again, there's the pyrus salicifolia, the weeping pear. And we've got um, little soft box hedges as well. And there's a geranium um, madarensi here, the purpley pink flower on the left-hand side and bronze fennel backing that. Really lovely combinations, absolutely beautiful. So yes, the planting is, is absolutely delightful in this garden. And in fact, you could probably spend a whole day and still not see every single plant in there. Mm -hmm. So should we go to the next slide as well? Yes. That's nice. And mm -hmm. I had to put this in because these are two of my favorite plants together. We've got black uh, Sambucus, black lace at the back, that's elderflower. Um, which is a, a, again a really lovely backdrop to plants and we've got Nectroscordium in the front which has actually been given a new name which I have actually written down here because I can never remember it. These people they keep changing the plants names I think it's Nallium again. Um, I'll come back to that. Uh, I'll come back to the name of it. I have written it down but I've written a lot of names down here and I can't find it immediately. But yes, anyway, Nectoscordium. And another thing, 
those are bulbs, these, these uh, beautiful allium shaped heads here. It is an allium essentially, but they grow to between five and six foot tall. Wow. And oddly, if you've got a patch of stinging nettles, they look beautiful growing up through stinging nettles. I saw that once at Sissinghurst. I don't think it was intentional, but they did look really good with stinging nettles. So um, you can say the stinging nettles are intentional then, can't you? So, um, <laughs> so we have the next slide as well, Pauline. That's lovely. And again, um, looking into the corner of the garden, you can just see it's a really sensuous garden and beautiful pots, beautiful bird baths. Um, again, the actual uh, furniture of the garden, if you like, the, um, the bird bath, there's, it, it just has a lovely poetry around it. And it's again, beautiful shapes and really very feminine, I think. It's a really, really lovely garden. The delphiniums are magnificent, aren't they? I have mm -hmm. delphinium envy. They obviously, um, well, they do have slugs, but they obviously grow quick and fast away from the slugs. Quite amazing. Should we have the next one as well? Yes. And so we're now looking back. We're actually sitting, I'm sitting in a cafe when I took this photograph, and this is looking across at Dunbeath Castle to give you an idea of where it is actually on the coastline mm -hmm. and how steep, how it sits above that on that cliff. And if you think where those wall gardens were, where we were just looking inside that, don't you think that's amazing that that's there? Um, on the, it's on the North Sea, it's on the East Coast. The North Sea, I always think is colder than the Atlantic anyway, mm -hmm. um, albeit a bit shallower, but still just imagine the gales. Um, I mean, <laughs> who would build their house there really? I know. Complete madness. Yeah. So we'll go to the next, uh, next, shot if that's okay. Grab. <laughs> so I had to put this in because this is at the Bay Owl uh, Cafe on top of a cliff, which is exactly where, this is my dinner, my lunch. And um, if you go to Dumbeath Castle, I believe actually Mr. Thriplund's actually built a cafe there. So you could have coffee and cake there before and then come here to the Bay Owl hotel I think it's called a cafe mm -hmm. which is on top of the cliff magnificent glass windows with this stunning view of the sea and obviously Dunbeath Castle and look at that Emily my daughter said who would eat raspberries with chips mum only you could do that <laughs> I tell you what it went down absolutely like a treat it was perfect absolutely perfect and good rich tea to go with it as well so um we're going to leave Dumbeath and we're going to go further north up the coast, up towards Ferrisdale now. Um, have you got the next slide for that one? Yeah. <clears throat> so driving, I'm going to tell you a wee story while Pauline's looking for the slide for me. Um, because we haven't got the picture. I just thought I'd mention that yeah, quickly. Right. Sorry, Pauline. Yeah, right. So we're going up to Berisdale um, and it hugs, the, the road hugs the coastline and it goes through amazing scenery, some beautiful, beautiful um, seascapes and uh, clearance villages, incredible history. And you actually drop down into Berisdale through this really steep snaky road. Mm -hmm. And this is now what we're looking at is um, Langwell Gardens. Langwell is in Bearsdale and it's at the bottom, right in the bottom at sea level. You enter Langwell, you turn left and through the gates and you go up through this incredibly long, beautiful wooded drive and you end up here at this walled garden here. And this, um, actually, this has always belonged to the Portland, the Duke of Portland. There's been many Dukes of Portland. And I'm gonna tell you a quick story about one of the Dukes of Portland. I'm not entirely sure which one it was, but he obviously, it was in the time when they had cars with those spoked wheels and terrible brakes because, um, he used to have his butler meet him when he came home from London. He used to drive from the train station in his old spoked wheel car. His butler used to have to be at the top of the road with a railway sleeper and he used to tie it to the Duke of Portland's bumper 
to slow him down going down the hill because he always liked to arrive in style in this beautiful old car of his. And so while he was driving down the hill with the dragging this railway sleeper to slow him down, um, he used to be able to look out and he liked to see roses, red roses outside his manor house no matter what time of year. So he had a whole, he had his butler on the road and he had a whole host of gardeners at his house, bringing out of the hot house in November or December, these pots of red roses and lining them up so the Duke could see them as he came down the hill or entered his house. And then as soon as he was ensconced in the house, the butler had to untie the sleeper from the back of the, the car. All the gardeners used to run back in with the roses into the hot house and didn't get chill. And he was obviously up with his feet with his whiskey in his glass. Anyway, the manor house to this beautiful walled garden is actually quite a long way from the walled garden. I mean, we're talking, it would take you quite a long time to walk there, probably a good, hmm, half an hour, 45 minutes to walk from this garden up to the manor house. Today, the gardens, the house and the gardens are still owned by the Portland. Um, it's Victor Cavendish uh, Bentick Portland. That's his name. And he's currently the ninth Duke of Portland who owns this. It's part of the Welbeck Estates. I think the Duke of Portland joined forces with the Dukes of Newcastle and formed something called the Welbeck Estates, which is this big business and they own multiple properties. Anyway, they do very well for themselves. So what we're looking at here is Langwell Gardens. That in fact is the gardener's house, which used to be many, many, many years ago, sort of the gardener's house, summer house. And um, we have here, this is one of my groups I took actually around the garden. And that's Peter McAnson, who's the head gardener. And he told this wonderful story about how it was so convenient having the garden so far away from the house, uh, the main house, because one of the ancient dukes, his wife, she used to like going to the garden, but she didn't always go alone. And she made use of the gardener's house or the, um, the summer house in the garden um, to entertain her guests. And he did an awful lot of winking when he was telling this. So we can only assume that she probably had um, fantastic torrid type gardening affairs, you know, sort of Lady Chatterley Lover type thing. I thought that was absolutely wonderful when you look at this beautiful garden. So Langwell, I love Langwell. When you go into Langwell Garden, it's like the garden gives you a huge hug. Um, you just look at those hedges. They are just incredible. They're like giant cuddly bears at the bottom of the garden. Um, again, this garden's built, designed on a cruciform, so you're looking down the central path with, again, sundial, uh, beautiful, beautiful herbaceous borders. But rather than having rooms full of flowers, they, the hedges are lined with these magnificent herbaceous borders. And then inside the hedges, there's kind of smaller gardens, if you like, um, with different themes going on. We go on to the next um, slide, Pauline. Langwell isn't very often visited. Um, I ought to have pointed that out actually. Dunbeath Garden is wonderful and you can visit at any time, but you have to do it by um, strictly by appointment. Langwell is the same. You can visit at any time. And um, Peter's always willing to take people around the garden. So this look at these beautiful curvaceous sculptured hedges that are really huge. Uh, I mean, they're about six to seven foot wide, uh, to give you some idea, they're about four foot high. I mean, you could actually fall in there. You could lose a small child in there, no bother. <laughs> you could probably lose a whole grown up, actually, to be quite honest with you. But I love these um, tapiri balls. They look like they've kind of got double chins, don't they? Mm -hmm. They're wonderful. So we'll go on to the next slide, Pauline. Yeah, this shows up from there. It's a very intimate garden. It's a really intimate garden because you can lose a group of 35 people in there. And I've actually done that quite a few times mm. and it's blissfully quiet. Um, and it is, it's just, a, it kind of speaks of a different time, a different era. 
And um, as I say, it's just the most amazingly intimate garden. It's very, very beautiful. I can't actually tell you how passionate I am about those hedges. I love them. Should we go on to the next mm -hmm. um, slide, Pauline? And that's, um, so when you arrive, in fact, oddly, that's the gate that you come through. You see that little hut there, you walk round the back of the wall and that's where you enter the garden, which I think is rather beautiful and um, to come through those big slumpy old hedges and then to see the herbaceous border stretching out in front of you. It's um, really, really lovely. Uh, the pink fluffy plant, which we see quite a lot of is Philopendula. And again, there's lupins and there's Lysomachia in the front here. Um, and actually that's the lictrum, that tall kind of creamy white thing there. Um, if we go on to the next slide, Pauline. Mm -hmm. It's a very long garden, isn't it? It's lovely. It is, it's actually quite a big garden. I can't remember how many acres it is. It must be over an acre, at least easily an acre, maybe two acres. Um, and the other thing I think that makes this such a sumptuous garden is the depth of the borders. You're looking at 15 foot across for a herbaceous border. And they are, as you can see, completely stuffed. And what works really well is the repetitive planting. Mm -hmm. So you've got, um, you can see the philopendula, the pink philopendula um, replanted, going down through the backs of the borders of the tall plant. And then you've got the beautiful purple salvia and the pita, again, repeated all the way down. And it kind of gives you a sense of, um, I don't know, tranquility. And uh, it's kind of order in a, a large garden. It's, it is, it's something that's possibly quite necessary because the beds are so vast and big. Mm -hmm. So we go on to the next slide, Pauline. Yes. Yeah, Again, nice. that is the colour schemes. I love the colours. It's um, all tuned to different times of the year. And in fact, this, is, this garden is planted up to be at its best in August when um, the Duke comes up to stay. He only comes up for doing shooting, hunting and fishing, apparently. But everything has to be timed to his arrival. So the water lilies are flowering and the peter's flowering. Everything's looking beautiful and again it's the soft colors you don't get um the mad south african type flowers here it's all kind of beautiful soft uh whites and purples and blues beautiful it really actually works with the wall as well very well should we go to the next one as well pauline mm -hmm. again that um just shows the just kind of shows the, the, the depth, the, just the depth of the wooliness of the whole garden um, and just soft, soft curves and soft edges, really, really beautiful. Should we go to the next one as well? Nice wall. Yes, mm -hmm. so here we have, so when you come into the garden, you would normally be looking straight ahead down the herbaceous border we've just looked at. If you looked to your right, this is the view that you would see one of the rooms. Again, very simple uh, box hedges full of uh, fennel and the purple flower coming over the path is Napita, cat mint. And actually there's Rosa rugosa alba behind that too, um, which has the most magnificent perfume. And against the wall, we have uh, fan trained apples. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big pyrocanther in the corner there, that big green bushy thing on the wall there is a pyrocanther. So it is, it's soft, but uh, formal as well. We go to the next one, Pauline. And that's looking from the other, this is looking back down again towards the summer house. I just again, wanted to show that because of the, um, the really lovely double chin hedges, the balls at the end with the shed and um, the, just the softness of the coloring of the flower. So it's sort of a really, really lovely um, backdrop with the wall behind as well. And of course, there's the huge deciduous trees behind that. They're mostly beaches actually. They were really, really lovely. 
Should we go to the next one, Pauline? Mm -hmm. Looking at and um, this, this actually, these ones, me and Pauline just kind of shoved them in any old house. This probably should have been at the front when I was telling the story of the house and Lady Chatterley's type lover story with one of the ex, with the old Duke of Portland's um, wives. In fact, I was reading up some history about the one of the Duke of Portland, and I think he had six wives or something. He got through quite a few of them himself. So maybe it was one of them that utilized this house for her own nefarious activities. Hmm. Anyway, I digress. Mm -hmm. So the flowers, back to the flowers, the philopendulas, and we've got lupins, and we've got Lupita again, and we've got Anaphilus in the front here too, which is the white bobbly flower there, or is that Estrangia? No, sorry, that's Estrangia. Absolutely beautiful. And they all have this kind of really, just really lovely softness about them. There is a little bit of orange actually, which is interesting in uh, Daylily hemerocallus, um, which just lifts the blue slightly as well. It's really, really nice. Mm -hmm. Should we go to the next one, Pauline? Mm -hmm. The pond. So when you're walking down to the bottom with your the bottom of the garden that is with your back to the summer house that you've just walked through you have this absolutely beautiful old uh, formal pond which is delightful with these huge hedges and the great big trees and the lovely seat at the end and it sort of invites you down towards that pond um it's very very elegant really really elegant and that water is so so black I don't know how the Victorians did it, but they used to manage to get their ponds to be beautifully black with the whitest, whitest water lilies to kind of as a contrast. Should we go to the next one again? I think this is going to be our last slide, actually, the next one. Yeah, this says yes. Yeah. So the water. So there we have it. This is the looking down to the pond and the hedges. At the bottom, the big chunky hedges were really, really beautiful. There's the water lilies with the black reflective water. The chunky hedges actually through that gap, these gaps always invite you to go through, is actually uh, Peter's vegetable garden, um, which he was developing last time I was there, which was two years ago. And um, I think it was mainly for him and his wife, Jenny. Jenny, his wife also works in the garden, uh, but it is, it's, just stately and it's um, very peaceful and calming to walk around the garden and I would absolutely recommend going there. In fact a good day out is to go to perhaps, perhaps Dunrobin Castle in the morning and then possibly to Dunbeath, then go to the Owl for the lunch and then fi finally finish up at uh, Langwell or you could do it the other way around I suppose actually and end up at Dunrobin and have a cup of tea there too. So um, I'd like to thank you all for being very patient with my photographs and um, explaining things. Um, this is the point where I say, are there any questions <laughs> <laughs> um, about any of the gardens or anything else that you would like to ask me? Yeah. And I would love to know if any of you've been to these gardens I've shown you as well today. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm sure they have actually. Yes. They are very special. <laughs> Biggest midges in, that you ever saw. I'd like to ask you, Ben. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Uh, hang on. Who, who's, who's speaking there? Uh, Catherine. Catherine. Hello, Catherine. Yes, I can. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Um, yes, so I went to Inverroo Gardens in 2019. They were absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, there's one question I'd like to ask, though, because I went to two or three gardens that year. Was is Inveroo the one where they have the herons nesting in the trees? That's correct. Yes, they do. Yeah, it's yes, down on do. the little jetty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes. <gasps> yeah, it was yeah. amazing. Yeah. I was yeah. like, I had never, I never knew that herons nested in trees. It was yeah. absolutely amazing. It was. Mm -hmm. They choose uh, pine trees with flat, yeah, flat surfaces. They do. Yeah. And they make a terrible racket. Did they make that clacking noise when you were yeah, there? They mm. did, yeah. Because I yeah. was looking for them and I'm looking on them down on the sort of the stones and I was like, I never knew that herons um, 
nested in trees. Yeah. And they were so high up. It was amazing. It was mm-hmm. beautiful. And the gardens yeah. were absolutely amazing. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. They are lovely. I'm so glad you went. Absolutely Aww. amazing. So yeah. that was the question. I just, well, that was my question. Good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, thank well, you. No, that's absolutely nice. Absolutely amazing. I could just say your talk was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for listening. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> So, and thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. I'm going to go to Shirley next, and then I'm going to go to Evelyn, okay? And then Anne, okay? So I'll go to Shirley, Shirley first. Hi, hi, Sue. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, hi, I've never, hi. I've oh. never been to Langwell, but it very much reminded me of my local garden, Crathis. Do you know, is there any influence from one to the other? No, that's interesting. I know Krath is really well as well. Huh? And I can actually see that completely yeah. where you're coming from there. I'm Just not as stuff. far as I know. Yeah. But saying that, it was probably, um, well, there may be a possibility actually, because um, I'm just trying to think of the era when this Langwell would have been planted up. Uh, Crathers possibly would have been planted up at the same time. So in fact, the hedges would be the same age possibly. Mm-hmm. And so they would have got that same maturity. And obviously the gardeners, the head gardeners at the time decided to grow them very wide and to cut them very smooth and sort mm-hmm. of, you know, just beautiful feminine curves really, really beautifully. So they could have been an unintentional um, influence but that would be an interesting link to follow through to see if they knew each other the families at the time or more importantly the gardeners because it's always the gardeners that have the last word (laughs) you know we always say it's the duke of portland's garden oh yeah it's not really it's peter's garden (laughs) so you know yeah thank you thank you uh evelyn i'm going to come to you now hi hi there hello Can you hear me? Yes, we can. The sound's okay tonight. Yes, uh, I have been to one of them, Inveru. I haven't haven't been to the other two, but I've been to Inveru. I was trying to remember what year. I remember my son, who's in his 50s, he would be about eight. So it must have been about 1976. Yeah. Oh, wow. I remember the midges. I remember him rolling about on the grass, scratching (laughs) his head. And it was a terrible state. Uh, it oh, didn't seem to bother me so much but it seemed to go for him and I always remember I had a wee mini at that time and when we went back to the car <laughs> it was absolutely covered inside, oh. the midges were inside yeah. oh, the no. yeah. I don't know how they got in there yeah. and oh, I, I just I mean I remember the gardens were absolutely I think it was July time so I mean the gardens mm-hmm. were absolutely beautiful oh. um, but I must go back again I would love to go back again and see and to see the yeah. other two as well yeah Mm-hmm. You know, Evelyn, I'm going to Thank suggest you. if you go back, um, yeah. In View is notorious for the midges. And you yes. know midges, how they it survive. Is, they, drink, yeah. they drink the blood and they reproduce. So the yeah. best time to go is May, when, yeah. when there's no midges, or September, when they're, yeah. they're dropping off. It's just about the time I was working, so I had to take my holidays in July. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing. Now I can go anytime. That was yeah. that was the worst thing about in oh, the yeah. 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 horrible. Yeah. 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 By, by the way, Catherine is my stepdaughter, ladies. Oh, oh, just oh. Google Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Evelyn is my stepmom. Love oh. her oh. I've even got oh. the mug to prove it. I've got the <laughs> I've got the most, <laughs> the most awesome yeah. step mum, apparently. Yes. Uh, oh, she has she has the best step mum ever. I've got and I've got a big me. head. Yeah. <laughs> Enough of that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sue. That was great. Uh, it was, it was fabulous. Thank Thanks, yeah. Thank you. So I'm gonna to go to Anne now and then I'm gonna to go to Carol after that. So Anne first. Uh, hello, Anne. Hello, hello, Sue. Thank you very Hi. much. Super talk, thoroughly enjoyed it as I did the last one. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I live in the Black Isle, so we're not terribly far from your garden. And some of the ladies in, in Russia would like to visit your garden, in, ho- hopefully a, in August. Mm-hmm. Yes. We have it open. Now, do we contact you to let you know that we're coming? Yes, if possible. Um, huh? And absolutely. We have a garden open day in August, but if you if you yes. all can't make it then, mm-hmm. just contact us and you can come over and I can give you teas and things as well if you would like to come. 
Thank so you very much. Do you know where to, my contact details are on the Facebook page? Yes. To mm -hmm. Or Pauline can give you my yeah. contact details yeah. if you would like to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we'll thoroughly enjoy that. Yeah. Thank you That'd very be much. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Thank you. We we'll look forward You're to welcome. that. Hopefully things will have settled down more and we'll be able to travel in yeah. a group. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I do hope so. Mm -hmm. Look <laughs> forward you, to it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, now, Carol. Hello, Carol. I'm going to ask you to unmute, Carol. Okay. Uh, I, I, missed the, I missed the beginning of the talk. Uh, the last time that we were up, the, the house was getting done up. Uh, would that be about five years ago? Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, what is is it? Uh, is the house open now, or is it a guided tour it is, around the house? Or I yes, it is actually. Um, what is, they did because before it was um, used for the property manager to live in, mm -hmm. um, or for dignitaries from Edinburgh to stay in. So what they did was change it into private accommodation to rent out upstairs. They put another wall in, and they turned the downstairs into kind of museum. Um, and uh, how do you describe it? Kind of general visitor type center. And they've got a wee art gallery tacked onto the side and the old outbuildings, the old stables, and now is a tea room and a toilet. So they have finished the renovations um, and it is open to the public, yes. Okay, I just, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I love, it's a lovely, a lovely room, isn't it? The main room is a, it's got all parky flooring and everything. It's really yeah. Cool. Nice we used to do um, first aid courses in there. <laughs> I used to have to lie on Osgood's rug and have my legs bandaged. Yeah. <laughs> Was that just you and Will, your husband? Yeah. <laughs> no, actually. <no. laughs> Well, you should say that, Pauline, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Does anyone have any more questions? Pursue, and, or you might, you might have something that you want to ask her about your, a plant that you've, you've killed. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not killed. Mm. That's what happens in my, my garden. <laughs> everyone, everyone happy? No, I'd just like yeah. to say it's been absolutely amazing tonight. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Learned so oh, much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kathy. Oh, oh, thank, you. thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank Looking you, forward Lisa. to the next one. Oh, <laughs> well, I'd be happy to do another one. Yeah. Um, I was saying I actually go to Orkney Islands quite a lot to do private garden tours there. So I'd be oh. very happy to do Orkney Islands. Um, oh. I have a multitude of other gardens as well, actually. Um, in Scotland and down in England as well, some English gardens I could fit in, Sissinghurst yeah. and Great Dixter. That's the um, one. I'm nice looking well. forward to seeing your garden actually once we can travel again. That'll be good. Okay. Absolutely. Come, please do. I would love I'll you take all Evelyn come. with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bring everyone. Bring everyone. Evelyn I and I'll have everyone. a day out. So go oh. your garden. And I can That'll tell you more beautiful. stories. I can tell you more stories then. <laughs> yeah, it'd be lovely. I would love to see no, you all. No, thoroughly enjoyed this tonight. Lovely. Thank, thank you. you very much, everybody. Good. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank well, thank you all of you for thank listening you. and um, yeah. giving up your evening to listen to me yeah. rabbit on about plants and oh, it's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. So oh, I, think, I hope to see you all again. Yeah, what we'll do then yeah. is we'll give okay. um, so a big round of applause and say thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>